Hey, we're out in Olympia, Washington, and we're at the Last Word Bookstore in Olympia. And I'm very excited to be here because the reason why is it was a bookstore like this called uh, Bandaloops. It was a bookstore and coffee house where Belay Magazine first started. That was kind of like the precursor to Ground Zero. It was kind of like I was talking about science fiction and horror films. And we teamed up with a hillbilly punk magazine called Garage Pile. And my first interview was with Rob Zombie, and I was pretty excited about that. I thought, wow, you know, this is cool. I've made it. I interviewed Rob Zombie. But it wasn't until I was working for a radio show called The John and Dan Show. I was a radio producer and writer, and I wrote comedy for a while. And uh, one day, Dan Bombas, who's the guy that I worked with, said, hey, you got an opportunity to do a talk show. I said, I do? Why, how? He says, well, you can do a talk show however you want to do it. And I said, really? So they gave me this time. And the first day was April Fool's Day, 1995. And they said, you go on, you're King Fool, you're gonna do the show. I'm going, okay, great. So I opened the show and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is cult radio. And immediately I got a call from the program director. He says, what the hell? I said, it's called cult radio. I'm calling it cult radio. He says, oh no, you're not. And I said, okay, well then I'll think of something else. And so we sat in a room for a long period of time and we were discussing what we were going to call the show. So we were going to call it like Continuum or Addo Domini or something stupid. Like I wanted some name that was like really unique. And I said, why don't we just call it Ground Zero? And he says, why? I said, because Ground Zero is kind of like where the bomb goes off, where everything's zero, where everything's like we start over, and that kind of thing. And, and we can talk about things when it's all open and, and you know, anything goes, really. Um, and I said, mostly though, leading towards conspiracy theory, parapolitical and uh, all these topics. and. And uh, so I started doing the show, um, and I uh, wanted to make it sound really cool. And the way I did that is I was working, like I said, with the morning show, and they introduced me to Negative Land, which is a band out of San Francisco, Berkeley. And uh, what they do is they take production pieces and put them together. So I ripped off their Christianity is Stupid theme song, and I redid it so it didn't say, I didn't want to offend all my Christian audience, so I just had it say Ground Zero. We put Godzilla in it and all kinds of sirens and stuff. basically made it sound like the end of the world, how I thought the end of the world would sound. Godzilla would show up, of course, in my apocalypse because I'm kind of nuts. But it was fun. It took off. We were doing really well in Salt Lake and uh, moved to Portland, Oregon, to be syndicated by the uh, Nostalgia Broadcasting uh, Group, NBG Radio. I worked with people like Nina Blackwood from MTV, Snoop Dogg, and uh, Ed McMahon actually showed up one day, too. And it was kind of fun. We had all these people like hovering around and hanging out, produced the Liz Wilde show for a while, uh, got to be the Toxic Avenger, Lloyd Kaufman discovered me and had me do the voice of Toxie, and then I wound up doing this, well, what happened is 9-11 happened, and I went off the air for a little while, it wasn't really off the air, it was just I was put in my place like on the weekends, because they said that they didn't want the name Ground Zero to be used anymore, because Ground Zero is where... The 9 11 thing happened, and I told them I'm not going to get rid of it. And they said, Well, then we'll put you in a place where nobody listens to you. So, for the longest time, I was like hanging out, interviewing people like Alex Jones and other people. And I was kind of like in the shadow of Art Bell. And then, of course, uh, George Norrie came along, and I'm like, going, Wow, you know, I'd like to get back into the paranormal again. And uh, I was working at a company called Stream, which we were doing Xbox and uh, doing my show on the internet. And I did a thing called the Ground Zero Lounge, where I was going from bar to bar. And, you know, 250 drink minimum, everybody's drunk, talking about conspiracy theories. Penn and Teller discovered me there, and uh, it kept on building and building until finally um, I wanted to get back into radio because my fiance urged me to get back into radio. And I, uh, it was funny because they gave me a board op job at a, at a station called KXL. I'm going, but I'm a 
experienced talk show hosts. We're going to get paid minimum wage. You're going to push buttons and you're going to produce a bunch of shows. So I produced Michael Savage, another guy I produced, and was doing news stories and running beat and everything else. And I'm like going, God, I hate this. So I went to a friend of mine named Scott Mahalik who just bought a radio station in Portland. And I said to him, I says, I want to do rock radio again. I just want to be a rock jock. I just want to like spin the tunes, ramp up the Ozzy Osbourne records and call it a day. He says, why don't you do Ground Zero? And I said, what? He goes, let's do Ground Zero again. And I said, okay, because he remembered Ground Zero from Salt Lake. And uh, so they put me on Ground Zero on an FM station called KUFO in Portland, which I thought was cool. It's KUFO, I talk about UFOs, it's really awesome. And then KUFO, one day I woke up, KUFO was talk radio. I'm going, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to do my show full time. So I went to KUFO, I went to KXL, and I said, hey, I was doing the show on the weekends, it was a talk show on an FM rock, why don't I do it full time? They go, no, we don't want you. I go, what? You don't want me? What? You got me in here, now you don't want me. So finally, after got two or three weeks, I had a change of heart, they put me on again. And Brian Jennings, who was a producer, who produced people like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh, said, we're going to give you a break, and we're going to put you on the premiere. And I started off with uh, 97 stations. I now have 200. And I reach somewhere along the lines of, what, 2.1 million people a night. Uh, we do a full five hours. And then when Art Bell came on, we went back to three, and now we're back to five hours again. And um, I wrote this book called Riding the Shockwave, which is my new book. And I also wrote a book called Ground Zero Disclosure UFOs. And they're both published by Paranoia Press, and I was in Paranoia Magazine, which was one of my goals was to be in Paranoia Magazine. I was a big fan of Paranoia. And then I have the opportunity to work with Ron Patton, who is the publisher of Paranoia. And while I was uh, working in Portland, I ran into a crazy guy named Roger Cluton. And I found out that he was a ghost hunter. And the guy gets some of the best ghost stuff. And I needed a ghost hunter, because I had one before named Sarah Ruth, who was just nuts. And I couldn't work with her. And this is all going to go on tape. She's going to hear going to kill me. But then I went to the Roger, and he, he and this guy named Scotty Myers, they got some of the best EVP and some of the best ghost pictures you've ever seen. And I'm like going, we're back in business. We've got a crazy guy doing ghost hunting. We've got a great conspiracy publisher, and things are happening. And I mean, I, I worked with a lot of people. I mean, Tracy Twyman was one of my producers, and she's a great writer. And um, gosh, uh, gosh, a bunch of people that were involved with the show. They're now gone on to bigger and better things, and I'm still stuck doing a radio show. <laughs> so anyway, but no, I, I really enjoy what I do, and uh, we're very popular across the country. Um, <clears throat> we have great ratings. <clears throat> In every market we're in, and uh, my audience is probably, and I will say this for a fact, that I think my audience is one of the smartest audiences out there, and the reason why is because they can differentiate between what's fact and fantasy, they know when I'm pulling their leg, and they know when I'm kidding, and they know when I'm very seri serious about what I'm kidding about. So they know that through my metaphor and through what I say and all these things I do, they know that they're getting a message, and they can, they can look for it under the under the covers or that I'll be blunt and, and I'll give it to them right out and hit them like a cudgel and but in the meantime I think that my audience is the best audience out there so and my two of my best audiences right here <laughs> <laughs> they're the best audience I have right there two I'm just kidding and everybody's out here so 2.1 2.1 and two. there you go <clears throat> so there you go so are there any questions anyone want to ask any questions Questions. questions. Yes, I'm just kidding. No questions. You have a question. <laughs> you know, the cameras on. No one wants to ask a question. It's okay. What is writing the shockwave about? Writing the shockwave is a compilation of uh, things I've written over the years. Some of them I, I'm really surprised are recent things that I've written. Uh, one of the things that um, people don't know about me is that I am a history. Uh, guy. I, I love history. And the reason why I love history is because when I was in high school, I failed history. Um, I, I thought that I would take a college prep history class because I love the teacher. His name was Mr. Gad. And uh, he's dead now, I think. But Mr. Gad was the most interesting guy, teacher. He and J.C. Smith, two of the best history teachers I've ever known. And uh, somebody said, you gotta get Mr. Gad's history class because he'll make you love history. Well, I got Mr. Gatt's history class, and he hated me. He just hated me. I don't know why he hated me, he hated me. And so I just didn't like his class. I thought that he'd like me, because I think he's just wild and crazy, and I'm wild and crazy, but he didn't like me at all. 
And so when I got my F's, I had straight F's, and they said, you're not going to be able to graduate from high school unless you talk to Mr. Gadd and find out why you're not graduating. So I talked to him, and I said, I said, I love you, but you hate me. Why? He goes, I don't hate you. And I said, well, why is it that you failed me? He says, because I expected more of you. He said, I thought that you were going to be better than you were. Because he says, I heard a lot about you. Because I was on the TV news at school, and I was pretty popular at school. He says, I heard a lot about you, but you come into my class, and you just, you just don't apply yourself. And I said, okay, well, what do you want me to do? He says, I won't fail you, and you can graduate if you do me one thing. And I, what, what's that? He says, I want you to write me an essay about your favorite history subject. He says, I want it to be like seven or eight pages. And then he says, I'll look at it, and he says, if, if it's to my satisfaction, I'll pass you. <clears throat> so I went in, I wrote seven pages, and I walked in, and he ripped it up. I said, what did you do that for? I worked hard on it. He says, yep, you did. You worked on it, didn't you? Yep. So what I want you to do now, and I'll pass you, is, is that every day you wake up, he says, I want you to pick up a book, I want you to read some history, and he says, I want you to write it down. He says, you promised me you'll write it down. I said, I promise. He says, you're just telling me that, so I'll give you a good grade. I says, no, I promise. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a B, not an A. He says, I'll give you Bs, because I, I did that for insurance, because if I gave you an A, you'd walk out of here thinking you got away with something. I'll give you a B, and I'll pass you. He says, but you got to promise me you'll write. Ever since then, I did. I'd pick up a book, read it, read an encyclopedia, read something, and I would write about what I, I'd write about what I've re uh, read. And uh, when I did my talk show, I decided that I would sit down before every show, do research, and write about it. And I've done that now since 1995. And so what you see here is you see the first and probably some more modern versions of what I've written from 1995 until now. And uh, and then. This one is all my all my research on UFOs. In fact, it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more thorough, including an investigation I did in um, in uh, Davis, California, where a UFO crash landed uh, in Tracy, uh, Tracy Davis area, and uh, it got me some uh, actually some uh, uh, columns in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and Sacramento Bee. So, um, it I'm very happy with these books. People and and it's really cool is that I'm very flattered and very humbled. Um, in Amazon, they've given me five stars. These, this has been a five-star book so far. Nobody's written anything bad about it. I'm happy. Because I thought, oh, this is my first debut. And everybody's going to think, oh, gosh, this is horribly written. It's a bad book. Because I write how I speak. I, I, I you know, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not much into, you know, having to phrase sentences so it sounds all intellectual. I just write how I speak. <clears throat> and um, I think it's kind of like the USA Today of uh, uh, conspiracy stuff. Not that, not that low. It's not like Mick, Mick book, but uh, I, I, I think that people have read it and they like it, and, I, and I'm very happy they like it because I was very surprised at the response, and so I'm very. Can pleased. I put something out there for people that are gonna watch this? Yeah, sure. Just so people know, Clyde really does r sit down, and read, writes his show, and there's no script. When he does his radio show, he just he just does it from memory after writing all day, mm -hmm. and I've seen it, and I was amazed. The first time I ever saw him do it, I was like, how do you do that? You know. I mean, but now he answered my question. That was one of the well, I was it's crib notes, really. I mean, I have the article there, and sometimes I do lean on it a bit to get my, like, if there's any anything intricate and very detailed, I'll definitely look at what I've written. Uh, anything else, it's just right off the hip. And, and sometimes people say, well, you got that wrong. And I'm going, well, that's my rusty Rolodex in my brain. Please tell me what I got wrong so I can correct myself. And uh, that's what I've done um, since I've been doing my radio show. And uh, also another thing, too, people ask about the radio show. They ask, why is it so produced? Why is there so many things like the montages and stuff? And I said, well, when I started in radio, that's what I did. I was a producer. I wrote four morning shows. I wrote comedy. I produced bits. I produced funny commercials and song parodies. And, uh, and I said, that's, that was my job. And so then when Ground, Ground Zero came along, I thought, what would make it unique rather than me just getting up there and speaking? What would make it unique? And I said, I would make my production pieces. And so these montages I put together are kind of like uh, movie trailers. They're like, you make movie trailers about what you're talking about and people hear them and they're impactful. And it, and it changes how you, it, it gets you more in tune with what you want to hear and what you're talking about. So that's why I do it. And in fact, we used to play them, we still do, we play them at 35, uh, 35 after the hour. And the reason why, it was kind of a, uh, 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 kind of a move on my part because when people listen to the radio they never listen to it at the top of the hour they always tune in like maybe 15 minutes in or they tune in the bottom half of the clock so the, the the strategy was is if somebody's flipping through the dial 
and they usually flip through it about the bottom of the hour, they would hear this weird thing on their radio playing, and they're going, what the heck? is this your main difference between the blue states and the red states the missile shield is designed to protect the west from nuclear weapons russia the world's leading oil producer is tightly so this isn't just about politics it's about how we avoid world war it's about the war on terror is uh, i quote orchestrated from abroad when you, say, when you say you cannot say it, does that mean that you trip over the word? It means that I uh, uh, gobble it all up. They were orchestrated by NATO, and they've been carrying these attacks out against the civilian population of Syria for four years now. Boom! They were orchestrated by NATO. Like, in a, like an explosion. They were orchestrated by NATO. The war has begun. 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 They were orchestrated by NATO. Our viewers called in describing men with automatic weapons hanging out of helicopters. Behind me is a trucking company, probably one of many, that are transporting military parts and vehicles. The end has begun. This is an attack warning. Repeat, this is an attack warning. Attack warning means that an actual attack against this country has been detected and that protective action should be taken. This is an emergency action notification. All broadcast stations shall broadcast emergency action notification message number two, red card. This station has interrupted its regular program at the request of the United States government. Every day goes by, we learn more about the horrifying scope of this catastrophe, destruction, and suffering that defies comprehension. Our communities buried under mountains of concrete, families sleeping in the streets, injured, desperate for care, many thousands to a day. And then they hear some guy with a deep voice saying, aliens are under your bed. And all of a sudden they're going, I want to listen to this. And that's how we did it. That's and actually how I found you on KUFO. <laughs> yeah. You hear something strange on the radio. You're going, what is this? And then some guy's talking about aliens or, or uh, boogeymen or, or, you know, or conspiracy theory, contrails, chemtrails, or whatever you want to call them today. Geoengineering trails. And speaking of which, Alana Freeland's here. <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing. Um, she's been on my show many times. And space fence, uh, gosh, so many things that have now come to fruition and they're amazing and we're hearing about them and in fact North Korea just talked about well actually South Korea just talked about how they want to put up their space fence and uh, that's why China now is not happy <coughs> oh no North Korea is not happy with China because China was going to give South Korea permission to put up their space fence so yeah you were on it when you did your presentation for Ground Zero and she's been on the how many times have you been on my show now three times four times I don't know yeah Several times. I can't count how many times. So, yeah, it's yeah. been really good to have you on board. Yeah, and welcome to Olympia. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really love Olympia. In fact, what was it? I came here once with a guy because he wanted to get his boat out of the bay. Uh, is it called San Francisco Bay or something bay? He wanted to get his boat out of Boston there. Boston Harbor. Boston Harbor. Thank you. Boston Harbor. We got the boat out of there. We had crab. We put a cage in there, and you have to pay to get crabs. We had crab. And I really liked it here. The homes were, though, you know, $500,000. But... Um, yeah, and I saw, it was kind of weird, I saw the Capitol sitting there at the sound, in the sound there, and the sun was hit just right, and I thought it looked like Jabba the Hutt's palace. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and well, I really love Olympia, because Ch Jabba the Hutt's palace is right there on the sound, <laughs> being a Star Wars fan, so yeah, that's what I really enjoy. I'm sure the governor will love that. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. But I always say there, this is one of the places in Washington I like to retire, is either Olympia or Pulse Bow, or uh, one of the island areas, because I really like the Puget Sound area, really mm -hmm. nice. I, I pretty much stick to the Puget Sound area when I'm in Seattle because I just think sometimes Seattle is like so overwhelming. It's like these huge buildings everywhere and you're like, oh, where am I? But this is really nice. It's kind of more contemporary. You didn't like Vashon Island? Oh, I like going to Vashon and Mari Island when I twisted my ankle. That was another thing too, is memories of Washington. Um, I'm a big Mari Island guy. I, I love Mari Island. I love the investigation of Mari Island, even though a lot of investigators say it's fake. But I, I'm out to prove that it's not fake. I'm out to prove that it really did happen. We went to Tacoma Library. We found all these stories about how it happened. We went to the site where the B-25 crashed. 
two men were carrying UFO material. B-25 crashed out near a warehouse area. We went there. And we also went to a museum in Kelso, Washington. And we were all looking around. I said, can I ask you a question? And the woman says, what? I said, do you have, I heard this is true, do you have any of the wreckage of the B-25 that crashed just west of here? And she says, yes. And I said, could you like bring some out? And she goes, not very many people know about that. And I said, well, I do. I want to see it. So this guy showed up. They called this guy to especially come out. He put on these gloves and he brought out a piece of this molten plane. And he brought it out and he says, he goes, Owen, oh, you want to see the slag from the UFO? And I said, so he brought up this dark black rock and he sat there and says, that's supposed to be UFO material right there. And I'm like, really? I was like stunned. I, it was almost like, you know, I'm sitting there and they, and they, tell, it's, they tell me it's fake. I said, uh -uh, it's not fake, it happened. So, but then we went to Mari Island and did an investigation and, and I had just, how long was I out of the hospital? I, because I've had very bad health, but I'm getting better now. Um, and I just got out of the hospital like a few months. And so I'm going on this nature hike in Mari Island and I see some driftwood and I went and I jumped and I twisted my ankle. And what was really funny is that uh, the, the paramedics showed up, they had to take an ambulance across with a ferry and they had to pick up this 400 pound guy. Back then I was a lot heavier. And uh, they picked me up and they're all sweating all over me and they throw me in the back of the ambulance. The guy says, you almost got a life light called in to get you in there. They put me in this hospital where it's like it's like something out of CSI or uh, what is it? Uh, what do they call it? Code Black, <laughs> where everybody's like either a gunshot victim or a motorcycle victim, and it's like everybody's screaming at each other, blood everywhere. I'm laying there going, "Oh my God, where am I?" And uh, they didn't give me any pain medication, give me anything. They just sent me on my way, saying I, I rolled my ankle, and then we had to leave in a little Toyota truck about this big. And here I was all twisted up in this Toyota truck, and my legs all hurt. And we had to go three hours, and I was like in pain, but. It was worth it because we got some really good uh, footage, but a lot of great people, and that's why I love this area. Is because I mean, every time I've come out here, I've been welcomed and and uh, really uh, getting to know a lot of people. And I mean, and gosh, I can tell you stories about going to Everett and uh, hanging out in Everett, and they have this. I talk about the salt and the iron. There's this place called the salt and the iron. It's got a steak that's so good here. It's a plug for the salt and iron. I'm going to tell you a bit. And of course, you know, there's Kelso. Where it's you in Edmonds. Is that in Edmonds? I thought it was in Everett. And, and then, of course, there's a place called Swifties in Kelso where they have sweet cinnamon rolls as big as your head. I, I did that for them again, but they do. They're as big as your freaking head. And there's a lot of cool places here. And uh, and this bookstore is just, like I said, is exactly the way I started out doing fanzines and doing interviews. And and uh, I met Ro I, I met Molly Ringwald in a in a little place like this too. It's like we were drinking coffee and I was showing B horror films, Godzilla films, and she was there and I didn't even recognize her because she had black hair, she looked really like goth. And I'm thinking, you know, this goth girl's talking to me and we're having coffee and, and I asked her some questions and finally I realized I said, Well she asked she said some science fiction movie she was in, I says, Well, um, Barry Bostwick was in that movie. It was uh something Tales from the Forbidden Zone or something like that. And I said, Barry Bostwick was in there and there was this girl and it was Molly Ringwald and she goes, Uh huh. So, oh, you're Molly Ringwald. She was like, huh? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, um, Gary Sinise, who I didn't know who he was at the time, walks into the band of loops and says, um, we need to go, Molly. So she up and left, says, nice meeting you. And coming to find out, they were filming The Stand uh, in Salt Lake, and that's why she was there drinking coffee, because she was just doing a break. And so, yeah, I met a lot of interesting people, bumped into them. Uh, uh, this place, I mean, this show gets you to meet a lot of people. Um, Aaron Lewis from Stained listens to my show. Eric Roberts listens to my show, I know that. Uh, Marilyn Billy, Manson and Billy Twiggy Corrigan. Billy Corrigan listens to the show. Twiggy Ramirez, Marilyn Manson. I'm going to the list of everybody who said they listen. Uh, oh, and uh, Cranston. Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. He listens. Brian he lives Brian. in Palm Springs. And the reason why I know this is I was doing an interview uh, in Palm Springs, and, and I, the guy that was on the interview said, you know, this is the place where all the stars live. And I said, oh, yeah, I've heard Palm Springs is kind of like the haven. He says, yeah, so you got a lot of celebrities who listen to you out here in Palm Springs. I said, oh, yeah, really name one. He goes, Brian Cranston. I said, really? And he goes, oh, yeah, he talks about your show all the time. So, But none of them have been on. They just they just silently, quietly listen. I remember I was on the air one night, and I was talking about, oh, I was talking about birthers kind of disparagingly a little bit, you know. And uh, Orly Tate's called my show, who is the uh, 
Latvian woman. She's that blonde Latvian woman that wants to prove that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States. And she called and gave me the big run. And I says, Orly Tates is on the phone. And I was like, kind of feeling like weird about it. But, <laughs> you know, you never, you know, sometimes. And when Aaron Lewis calls my show, I'm always shocked because he goes, Oh, yeah, this is Aaron. And I'm talking to him. I go, Oh, yeah. He goes, Yeah, we're on tour right now. I go, Oh, Aaron, hi. And he goes, Yeah, we're listening to you on the bus going through Texas. So I'm like, Great. So, I mean, you never know who listens to the show. And that's why I say I, I really, I'm very appreciative. I, th I think we're. I think we're the intelligent conspiracy theory show because it just seems to me that I'm not, I'm, I don't have a lot of people that would listen to like Alex Jones or George Norrie. I mean, I probably have a little George Norrie people listen to me, but the Alex Jones people, they may listen to me too, but not as much. And I think we have people a little bit more refined, you know, that don't believe everything that goes down the, the conspiracy pipeline and, and they really want some intelligent conversation, which isn't really conspiracy theory. It's more or less, uh, alternative uh, news and margins news and stuff that doesn't get put in the mainstream, which nothing gets put in the mainstream anyway. I, I can't count how many times I've sat in my studio with these huge video screens everywhere and all I see is Donald Trump and all I see is Ted Cruz and all I see is all these guys, you know, fighting over each other and Hillary Clinton. It's all politics. There's, you can't escape politics now. Nobody wants to talk about anything interesting. They don't want to talk about politics. And then they turn everything into politics. Sex is politics. Religion is politics. But even the weather is politics now. Oh, global warming. I'm like, can we please have a discussion where if I believe that uh, the weather is not changing, that I don't sound like a conservative twit, and if I, and if I say that you know, I'm tolerant of, of uh, gay marriage, that doesn't make me sound like a, a liberal wacko. I mean, I, I'm just a person who, who has an opinion that's logical. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm, a, I'm an American citizen with questions. I'm an American citizen who wants to find out the truth. I want honest discussion and intellectual honesty about these things. I don't want to sit here and play ping pong between right and left because this whole right wing left with red state, blue state stuff, it's like, it's not red state, it's not blue state, it's the state versus you. It's always been that way. And if you want to go right wing or left wing, both wings make the bird of fascism fly. So why do you want to participate in this nonsense? Let's talk. Let's find it a, uh, let's find a goal we can all agree on. And uh, that's the problem with this country right now is that we just don't have, we just don't have a consensus goal anymore. You know, before we'd have a consensus goal, you know. Uh, keep the communists out or kill the Nazis or all these things that we did back in the old days and uh, you know we had something to fight against or fight for rock and roll was rebellious and satanic how it should be and <laughs> now we have little wimpy songs and we have oh don't press your luck and don't take risks and let's do what the government says and you know it's like it's like, you know, you go back to, the, like, for example, all the president's men, you know, Woodward and Bernstein. If they were alive today, well, they are alive, but if they were working today in a newsroom and they were trying to reveal the President Nixon, you know, in the Watergate thing, they'd be considered conspiracy theorists now because of the fact that they said, well, there is a conspiracy. It's called Watergate. Ah! Ah! Now you say something like that and go, ah, oh, no, come on. What, you hate Obama? No, not really, but I just want to point this out because I want to keep the empire honest, but nobody wants to do that anymore. So, anyway, I've talked up a storm. Anybody want to ask any questions? <laughs> anyway. What's uh, special about doing your show from Portland? Uh, okay. Uh, I moved to Portland because of the fact that I thought that the Northwest, and it is, Northwest is probably, I always say, Utah and Salt Lake City was a place for urban legends and myths. Mormons, man, they do that. They talk amongst themselves and they do these Mormon Twilight Zone stories that you just, I don't know, they're weird. That was what was cool when I was there. Moving to the Northwest, however, it was Bigfoot, UFOs, D.B. Cooper. I mean, all these things that I grew up w listening to and watching are all here in the Northwest. Mari Island, Northwest. Uh, uh, Kenneth Arnold, UFOs, Northwest. Um, Bigfoot, Northwest. Uh, D.B. Cooper, Northwest, and then, I'll tell my D.B. Cooper story, I move to Portland, Oregon, and I'm listening to George Norrie, well no, it wasn't George Norrie, it was the guy that filled in for him, the, the guy that's the, Ian Punnett. Ian, Ian Punnett, I'm listening to Ian Punnett, and this lawyer comes on, his name's Galen Cook, and he says, I've got definitive proof, and he's an FBI guy too, he goes, i got definitive proof that I know who D.B. Cooper is, and here's a picture of him. 
And uh, my friend, who is Jonathan Burgess, Dr. Burgess, says to me, hey, Clyde, I think you should, excuse me, he says, I think you should investigate this D.B. Cooper story that's gone on Eden Putnam's show. And he goes, this guy is going to release the picture, and he's going to tell everybody who it is. He releases the picture. I look at the guy and go, oh, my God. And he goes, what? He goes, I know this guy. He goes, who is this? He says, his name's Wolfgang Gossett. And when I knew him, he was a priest in Salt Lake City. And he goes, no. I go, yeah. He says, we got to get a hold of this guy and tell him you know him. I called, and I said, this guy I knew. I hung out with him in Utah. We went on paranormal trips. He, he actually is an inspiration for Ground Zero because... Um, he used to do paranormal investigations and he wanted to reveal paranormal fraud. That was his whole purpose of it. He was a Catholic priest. He worked for the FBI. He, he for the missing persons department. He was involved with the criminal investigations. He, he was like super priest. And I'm like going, I like this guy. He's amazing. And I remember I, uh, I was doing a video. One of my first videos I did for broadcasting school was about ghosts and about, uh, stuff like that. And, uh, uh, he was talking about it at some lecture he did at East High School. And I remember this guy knew named Lynn, Lynn Kenley who worked with him at Woods Cross, and he was uh, a, uh, I guess he was a, a religious counselor. And I said, um, I went and saw Wolfgang Gossett speak at East High School. He said, oh, you don't want to go near Wolfgang Gossett. And I said, why? Because he's got ties to some pretty important people. And I think that he had, he's hiding something. And so I lived with that my whole life. And then when I found out that they thought that he may have been a suspect, in the D.B. Cooper case, being the D.B. Cooper, I, I said to Galen, I said, if there was anybody who would be D.B. Cooper, it would be this guy, because he has just this way about him, and what a way to hide out, you know, you go and you hijack a plane, you take the money, and then you go become a priest, and, uh, and I said, that's, that's a good cover, and so I'm convinced that Wolfgang Gossett is D.B. Cooper, and what's really cool about it is, is I can say I worked with him, um, and there was a guy named Aaron Duran, who was one of my old producers for Ground Zero, who did a magazine called Brujeria. It was a, it was a comic book. He's a comic book writer now. He did a thing called Brujeria. And before he found out anything about me knowing D.B. Cooper, or allegedly knowing D.B. Cooper, he did this He did this, uh, uh, He did did this. this thing about the men in black. He had this uh, story that he did about the men in black. And the men in black are all saying, well, who's training us? And he says, well, this guy named Clyde Lewis, he, he does a radio show in Portland, Oregon, and, and uh, nobody knows he's a true MIB. And they says, well, who trained him? He says, D.B. Cooper trained him. And so I said, how the hell did you know that? And he says, I just guessed. I said, now I know him. And it's, it was kind of a weird synchronicity like that. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, somewhere there's this wonderful comic called Brujeria where I'm in it, and they say that I knew D.B. Cooper and that he trained me to be an MIB, and that's what I do. So I'm kind of a secret MIB. What's that? What about that last show we did with Galen Cook, and we had that painting? Can you talk about that painting? Yeah. Galen Cook came all the way from Alaska to tell me that he found this painting of Wolfgang Gossett. And, uh, oh, thank you so much. Oh, great. Um, he found this painting of Wolfgang Gossett reading the Bible. And uh, it's a D.B. Cooper button for those of you watching at home. Um, he brought this painting of Wolfgang Gossett reading the Bible. And uh, in it, he's reading it, and while we're doing a show about it, he goes, this painting was painted, blah, blah, blah. He's talking about it. I'm thinking, this, this is kind of like interesting, but not kind of interesting. And the listeners are probably like going, <sighs> you know, falling asleep. I noticed I was looking at the picture that there's this door, and he's like reading the Bible, but there's this door there. And then you see like what looks like a, a winding river behind him and this guy standing near a tree and he's pushing something into the trees and I'm looking at him and going hold, hold on a minute this looks like a guy pushing a parachute into the trees and Galen goes oh my god it does I says and that's the Columbia River because apparently D.B. Cooper when he parachuted down he didn't land in aerial because everybody says he landed in aerial washing he didn't because when you jump out of a plane in November and a storm's blowing, you have the east winds going through, the, the, the canyon winds go through. So he, got a, he got, had to have been blown over into either St. John's or some other place, not Ariel. Well, the Columbia River goes right through there. And on one side of the Columbia River near a place called Tina Bar or Tina's Bar, they found some of the money. And they thought that what happened is he fell out of the plane, landed near Tina's Bar, buried some of the money, and then shoved the parachute somewhere in the woods. And so I said, there's the guy pushing the parachute in the woods and uh, it's on that painting. And so Galen's going, wow. And then so there's another indicator, another 
sort of a uh, Paul is dead type thing, which is very obscure, that he, you know, was B.B. Cooper and he was pushing that parachute into a tree. So that was another interesting thing. There have been a lot of uh, interesting synchronicities and strange things that have happened on the show and uh, all kinds of strangeness and that you just can't explain it. Or syn a lot of synchronicities that happen that happen on the air too, which, um, you know, I wish I could go back and find them all because they've always been... Um, this it's been fascinating doing this, and it's also been fascinating meeting people and finding out who listens, going on ghost hunts and, and having, uh, you know, strange things happen on the air. We're using ghost boxes to talk to the dead and all this crazy stuff. But, you know, and we do have room for things like, you know, um, treachery, government, conspiracy theory, um, uh, it, revealing the, the corruption of the government, keeping the empire honest, that sort of thing. And, and that's why Alana does it too when she does her books and that's why she's a prize guest and there are other people too that do it that come on and do it as well. And, and I like to think that while George Norrie has his people, I have my people. And, and, and that's the good thing is because I have my people I rely on and they're, and they're making names for themselves on the show too. And, and that's why you know I'm, I'm excited now to have my own people that I can rely on to give me good information. So that's good. That way I don't sound like I'm copying. You know, it's like, I don't want to be like... Parroting. Somebody. Yeah, I don't want to be uh, parroting someone else. I want to be unique. Yeah, but what I like about you, Clyde, is that you do your own research. You really dig in, and uh, I feel like I'm talking to someone intelligent who isn't just... Uh, I'm a good fool. ...setting me up uh, for, you know, for me to blah, 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 blah. You know, people aren't used to that, though. In fact, I get a lot of... Sometimes I get people who say, well, I wish you let the guests talk more. And I write back and I say, it's my show. <laughs> I go, you know, yeah, I'm sure you're used to podcasts where guys just sit back and go, and, and, and they don't know what to say because, and the thing is, is that I do do research and I'd rather have a conversation with an intelligent human being like Alana and, and know that I did the research with her so that I'm not just sitting there going, uh, so, uh, what kind of car do you drive instead of, you know, instead of asking a question that's pertaining to what she's written about. And uh, it makes it for a better conversation. Because, I mean, you know, you can always tell when somebody phones it in. But if, if a person actually sits down and does, I do, I, mean, I do about five hours of research every day. I come in about 11.30 in the morning, get my Starbucks out, drink a big one down, and then I just go to town. And I even do it when I'm at home. You know, I get up first thing in the morning, I look at the news, I, I look at videos, I watch things, and I, I, I I don't know, things inspire me to do shows, and I come up with really stupid titles and kind of silly titles, because I like to play with words, much to the, much to the uh, aggravation of my friend who's a librarian, a master librarian. <laughs> she freaks out every time I play with words. Sarah, yeah. she's, what are you doing? You're playing with words. I go, mm, yeah. I just like to do that. Making up your own lexicon. I make up my own words, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, one was Refugee Hottest, which I made up. Now people are using it. I just, I don't know, you want to be either the... Refugees or the refugee hottest. I don't know how we're going to figure that out. So, you know, what about douche canoe? Douche canoe. That's one of my favorite uh, put downs. And uh, and I wanted to find something that was really harsh to use that I wouldn't be bleeped for. So I decided to use the word ass clown. So if anybody calls up and they want to be a real ass clown, I tell them they're an ass clown. Because there's nothing funnier than a clown. <laughs> you can't say the other, you can say a hole on the air, so you have to right. say ass clown. And it's just funnier, <laughs> I think. So, yeah, that's what I do. And I like how you defend, uh, when callers come, you've defended me a couple times where they're trying to make me sound like an idiot. Yeah, damn right. And you go after them. Damn right. I, that's one thing I will not tolerate. I do not tolerate insults to my guests, nor people I associate with. I just won't do it. Because they do the work. That's the whole thing. They're doing the work. And no matter how crazy it sounds, they're doing the work. And you're just sitting back on your snack well's ass making fun of people. I, th I don't like that crap. I, and I, ooh, it just aggravates me because they're like these armchair critics and they never do anything. They just sit there in their, their stupid chairs and be the, you know, they, they get into the court of public opinion and it's usually all covered in wrong sauce. It's not, it's not worth it, you know? And, and so I just, I just go after I know. Have another drink. <laughs> get your head out of the bong. <laughs> We're trying to give you something that you can actually, you know, um, that you can actually do and, and uh, research. It's another reason why I put out the book, too, because I've had a lot of people complain that, you know, I always talk about the things you talk about, I never can phrase it like you can. I said, well, then just plagiarize me. Or kids say, 
I'd like to piss off my teacher. Could you please give me something in reference? I said, yeah, buy my book, or I'll tell you what. You call me up, and I'll help you do your homework so you piss off your teacher. <laughs> and they go, really? Uh-huh. And they go, why do you want to do that? And I says, because I just love having students call me on the phone or write me emails wanting to talk about a certain subject on Ground Zero, and I just help them because I know that if they get up in class and they say this stuff, you know, or do some alternative history or something in class, the teacher's going to go, what is this kid saying? You know, this bit. I did that one time for a guy who wanted to talk about, uh, he wanted to talk about global warming, and he had a hard time accepting it, and I said, and he called me, he says, hey, um, could you help me? I want to write a term paper about how global warming is uh, kind of false. I says, I'll do one better. Where's your class? He says, he says it's a PSU. And I says, I'll appear there. Tell your teacher I'll show up. I showed up, and the teacher hated me. He, oh, man. Teacher just hated me. And he was, like, trying to fight me. I said, I said, he asked me to come here and speak. I'm here to speak. Now, if you want to just tell me to leave, I'll leave. Oh, no, no, no. Keep going, Mr. Lewis. Keep going. And it was just aggravating him to no end. And I just said, well... Nice talking to you all. See you later. And the and the, the whole students got up, gave me a standing ovation. And the teacher sat there and just he was like just angry. But um, and that's because of the fact that I think that people are so used to accepting uh, what they're being told, and rather than research it and find out that there's another story, there's an extended middle, there's a right, left, and a middle. So there's always a third side to every story, and we try to give the third side to every story. I, and that's what I, and that's why I like, and that's why I'm glad I'm on at night too. Because you can listen to all the guys all day long, but I have the last word. And that's what I like about it. Because I'm usually the last person they listen to before they go to bed. And so that's why I like to basically tool it so that I have the last word. And that I, I'm the one who tells you, you heard, it all before, you heard all the guys before me, and now I'm going to tell you how it really is. And that's, that's what I do. I'm also finding out that Ground Zero sounds good in the morning as well. I've had a lot of people tell me, listen to you in the morning, it works. And it does. I was kind of afraid it wouldn't, but... I, yeah, you can listen to me on SoundCloud in the morning. I walk to work every morning. About and it works, doesn't it? It's perfect. Like, yeah, I don't know why. Everywhere. It's really eerie. I would never push the show as a morning show, but it, it works as a morning news show sometimes. And I was very surprised because somebody told me, I said, you li I said, do you ever listen to yourself? No, I said, I'm not my biggest fan, so no, I don't. And they said, well, no, you should listen to yourself in the morning sometimes. Get up, get yourself a cup of coffee, sit down, turn it on. And it does work. I'm like, going, wow, you're right. It, it sounds like it would be a fun little morning show where we talk about all this interesting stuff so yeah so if anybody out there is seeing this and wants to put me on a morning show and pay me six figures i would love it <laughs> or buy my book which hopefully would get me six figures you follow the today show for me and they just it's a perfect transition. really yeah. see that's the thing i it's kind of like you know beer and cake I, I i it's it works for some reason i don't know it just works so yeah. Does everybody else want to ask a question? Anybody else want to ask a question? Are we all done? Did I talk it all out? Yeah. Are we done? Yay. Thank you. Okay. We're big fans of last words here. Okay. So, oh, good. Yes. Last word. I'm sorry. What was your name again? Yeah. Uh, I have one final question. Winky Finkelstein. Clyde, would you sign my copy of the Unabomberous Manifesto? I will. That's Thank that's you. amazing. I will sign that. that. Yeah. As I know. Anybody bring sharpies books. today? I'll <laughs> sign this. Would you happen to have a sharpie, Scott? Sure. <coughs> um, although I can't. Oh. It to it. I'll sign it in pink. Yes. I love that. Lipstick. Yeah, it works. I like lipstick. <laughs> Uh, my cough is getting better. I hear you've got it. That's coffee. Oh, that's coffee. Very nice to meet you. She'll be lagging at the end of the month. It's a pink, you know. I know. Special pink. Thank you. Yeah. To Vince from the Shack of a Madman to my favorite madman, Clyde Lewis. <laughs> I love Vince. AKA the Unabomber. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. Cut it.
Yeah. Yeah.